They're home again, these young Australians, home from war, and they march with honour through the streets of Sydney. They're from the 1st Battalion Royal Australian Regiment, and the units attached to it these last 12 months in South Vietnam. They're part of the first professional army Australia has ever fielded, and they wear the first medal the Queen has ever awarded Anzac troops alone. Their average age of 21 makes them part of today's gear and go-go generation. But as soldiers, they hold to the traditions of their fathers, who fought in World War II, and of their grandfathers, the original diggers of World War I, who forged the Anzac legend more than 50 years ago. Day six of a search and destroy mission in War Zone D, a Viet Cong stronghold 40 miles north of Saigon. The Australian 1st Battalion Group moves into new positions in the scrub, seeking contact with the enemy. American battalions, supported by armour, move into more settled country close by. The brigade to which the Australians and Americans belong has had little contact with the Kong, though three of his main force regiments are known to be in the area. Casualties have been few, most caused by booby traps the Viet Cong leave behind. Engineers from the battalion's attached 3rd Field Troop, Royal Australian Engineers, cautiously clear the Australian area, one of the many dangerous jobs that earn for the sappers the admiration, if not the envy, of the foot soldiers. With the experience of more than 20 major operations behind them and the world's most thorough jungle training before that, the troops quickly turn dense bush into a reasonably comfortable bivouac. The companies dig in around the battalion's perimeter and standing patrols are stationed well outside the lines to prevent surprise. Then, as usual, there's nothing to do but sit and wait and endure the heat and think of home. Outlying patrols in contact with the enemy call for mortar support. Brigade headquarters, the target of the main Viet Cong assault, immediately orders in artillery. The first guns are those of the Australian 105th Field Battery, Royal Australian Artillery. Covered by US Air Force jets, they are lifted in by Chinook helicopters of the brigade's tactical transport company. Once down, the guns are soon in action, responding to target information passed on by signalers in the battalion command post. The combined fire response increases as more batteries of guns come in, and the Viet Cong assault ends as abruptly as it began. Daylight action of this scale is practically unheard of. 
We must have stumbled onto something big, the soldiers say. Like the time we found that VC headquarters underground. Or maybe the Kong are politically desperate for a victory. Who knows, except the Kong. And the troops prepare to face a night during which the enemy battalions attack again. In the morning, the troops saddle up to face day seven in war zone D. And all they know for sure about the night's events is that the Viet Cong didn't win. But the lines are buzzing with rumors all the same. Details of the action will remain uncertain until patrols bring in and count the bodies and collect evidence for intelligence to assess. Most of the patrols go out on foot, but these men, as soon as they finish breakfast, will ride. A company moves down through a rubber plantation to join a mechanized sweep through surrounding villages, whose populations are known or suspected to be sympathetic to the Viet Cong. They travel in fast armored personnel carriers, which provide some protection against the mines and ambushes that are the bane of road communications. The carriers are manned by troopers of a renamed unit. They were formed from the regular squadron of the 4th 19th Prince of Wales Light Horse, a citizen military forces regiment, but are now redesignated the 1st APC troop of the new 1st Cavalry Regiment, Royal Australian Armoured Corps. An American general, however, has refused to accept the change. Hell no, he says. They lend tone to my outfit and describes them in orders as King George III's White Horse. The patrol maintains contact with Australian Army spotter planes, or bird dogs, which report back any movement on the ground. Troops clear the area and check the villagers as they come home. Last night, Viet Cong soldiers, their mortars emplaced in this village, timed their fire to synchronize with that of an American battery some distance away. For a time, the Americans believed they were being fired on by their own guns. When the stratagem was uncovered, the Kong mortars were quickly silenced, and this is the result. Why do you burn my house, a villager demands. Why did you let the Viet Cong use it, is the reply. How can I stop them? The answer is, where have all the young men gone? The young men are with the Viet Cong and may be lying dead in front of brigade positions now or buried by their comrades in shallow graves. An intelligence corporal, one of three Vietnamese-speaking members of the battalion, asks permission to set up a medical clinic. This is standard practice for the battalion's medical platoon mostly bandsmen who work as stretcher bearers in the field. In this village, bitter and suspicious, few patients come forward for treatment by the battalion's doctor. But in other villages, many do. And maybe even here, when the troops move on, some will remember that there are soldiers who fight but neither rape nor pillage nor inflict needless pain, but try instead to mitigate the misery of war. What happened last night? Nothing. What have you seen today? Nothing. Where have all the young men gone? I don't know. The soldiers are looking for any evidence that will give them a clue to the direction of the Viet Cong retreat, but they find nothing in the deserted villages along the trail. These Chinese-made anti-tank rockets were dropped by a wounded or dying man. Weapons are mostly new and very well-made Chinese copies of Russian arms, treasured by owners who have no use for them now.
More than 200 Viet Cong bodies have been picked up and buried, 20 of them killed by the Australians. One Australian has been slightly wounded. American casualties are officially described as light. The next to nil casualty rate is counted a stroke of extraordinary good fortune by the Australians. A river running through the Australian lines is more than ordinary good fortune too. Being able to wash and cool off in Vietnam's heat is simple luxury in the field. But iced water and a hot meal in the evening is taken for granted. From day two on, in any fixed location, the meals are brought into the troops as part of the quartermaster's resupply program. Thanks to helicopters and the quality of the cooks, they're the best fed troops in the history of Australian arms. Imagine diggers in the trenches of Gallipoli or along the Kokoda Trail topping off a chicken dinner with a can of cold tomato juice and a fresh apple. And also thanks to helicopters and the skill of the medics, these soldiers are less likely to die of wounds than any in the history of war. When not on patrol or on picket or other duty, the troops spine bash in the time-honoured fashion of soldiers anywhere and hope that nothing more will happen before the operation ends. It is day 10 in War Zone D. The battalion's colonel tells his orders group that the battalion is moving back to its permanent camp at Bien Hoa Airfield. The Americans move out tonight and in the morning. The white or light horse go with them. The rest of the battalion stays to cover the extraction of the guns and then lifts out at 14.30 hours tomorrow. By 1600 hours, there'll be nobody left in War Zone D but the Kong.
Every subunit of the battalion group has its pub. Except for occasions like this, they don't open until the working day ends and close again for evening stand to, finally shutting at 9 pm. While these soldiers enjoy their hard-earned beer, others are out in the battalion's tactical area of responsibility, helping to protect one of the busiest and noisiest military air bases in the world. Life in Bien Hoa is not too rigorous now that most of the comforts of home have been installed, but these men, after Saigon for a day's leave, are happy to go. Leave is regular and every man can expect a week in either Hong Kong or Bangkok before his tour is up. And the fact that opportunities to spend his pay are limited here means that when on leave, he's never short of cash. And when he comes back, he's never short of work. This is a class for junior NCOs training for promotion in the ranks of an expanding army. Training and retraining is continuous here, and drill is about as popular in Bien Hoa as it is back home. This is another kind of school, run by the Royal Australian Army Educational Corps. The soldiers here are sitting for a social studies examination, at the end of one of a series of courses which can take a man up to matriculation standard. The courses are popular, though cynics in the ranks suggest that this is because soldiers are released from normal duty to attend. A more likely answer is that the better a soldier's education, the better his pay, and the better his chances of promotion. The desire for self-improvement is no less common among soldiers than in other parts of the community, and the facilities for it are better than most, even here. After school, sport. Victory at touch football is sought with considerable sincerity, thanks to the gentle advice and encouragement of rival company sergeant majors. Sports of all kinds are popular with the Australians, and while it's true that the gunners of 105th Battery tend to favour cricket, there is no basis to the rumour that the cavalrymen play polo from their carriers. Then, almost too soon to believe, it's time to go again. It's a big one. War Zone D again, the target of Viet Cong headquarters. Lift off is 0700 hours in the morning, and the Australians go in first. Heavy opposition to the landing is expected. All equipment must be checked and ready today. Armourers say that on the day before an operation, they're as busy as a betting shop on Cup Day. No soldier would go into the field with equipment not in perfect order. Every man has memories. Too many memories now. 
In the morning, nobody talks much. Every man knows what he's here to do. <laughs> 